What's up and welcome back to another live stream with Gizmo Slip Tech. Today, we're taking a look at the Razer Blade 14. This is arguably the most premium gaming laptop in the 14 inches or smaller category for certain premium features like a unibody aluminum chassis, the Blade 14 is kind of in a class of its own as far as I know. This is my gaming laptop spreadsheet. If you wanna check it out, there is every single gaming laptop that money can buy out here, at least in the United States and many international links in here as well. There are benchmarks on here, tons of data on here. You can go in here, you can click on any of these and you can look at pictures. And we're gonna look at through each of the 14 inch laptops that are out there. And uh, you can even filter on the left here by price or by screen size or laptop weight. So maybe you wanna get to a certain level of time spy performance or CPU performance. So starting off, here's the Blade 14. It costs $26.99, all right? So the Blade 14 is not a cheap laptop, but the design is clean. It has Windows Hello. It has very minimal bezel, a little bit on the bottom, a little bit on the top. We've got a webcam shutter at the top. Top. You got a large trackpad here and you got, I guess, high quality ports. Not too many ports though on this. There's no full size SD card slot. There can't be any Thunderbolt 4 because this is a Ryzen processor. So that's one trade-off you get when you go with a Ryzen processor. This comes with a Ryzen 9 7940HS, which is an excellent CPU, eight core, 16 thread, RTX 4070, and it should be reaching close to the 100 watt power limit that the 4070 needs to reach close to full performance. 16 gigs of DDR5 4800. Honestly, at this price point, I would hope that we would be getting 32 gigs. At least 16 gigs hits the minimum for the vast majority of games and applications that you need. And it is faster RAM, but not as fast as the fastest DDR5 5600, one terabyte SSD and a QHD 240 Hertz, 100% DCI-P3 color gamut display. So it should be a highly colorful display. It weighs just over four pounds, 62 watt hour battery. The Zephyrus G14, this is arguably the biggest competitor to the Blade 14 because it basically undercuts the cost by not including a unibody aluminum chassis, not a 240 Hertz display. This does have Windows Hello, it does have pretty good speakers and it does have pretty good build quality, but it's not gonna be as rigid or as firm as a unibody aluminum chassis. The G14 can be equipped with a 4080, which gives it a lot more GPU performance, 15,700 for Time Spy. That's a hefty amount of performance in a 14 inch laptop. And the G14 can also be equipped with a 4090, which gets around 18,500 for Time Spy. Again, amazing GPU performance in a 14 inch laptop laptop uh, and the Blade 14 just cannot be equipped with a 4080 or 4090 uh, GPU at this time. So if you're after the vast, like if you're after like the most possible GPU performance in a 14 inch category, the G14 is gonna be better in that sense. But if you're comparing the 4070 versions, then you're gonna be focusing on primarily on like the build quality, what the laptop's made with, the, fir the firmness and the rigidity and the kind of like the premium feel, the touchpad's bigger on the Blade 14. The, the G14 also could potentially have a, mini LED backlight, which gives it a higher level of contrast and potential screen brightness. So that's another potential advantage for the G14, but know that not all G14s come equipped with that. And I know the 4070 version does not. And you can either get it with this back LED lit thing, or you can get it with the mini LED coming back to the feet. The Aero 14, the Aero 14 being an extremely thin and light, only 3.2 pounds. And there are, I believe, no USB A's on this guy. Only three USB species with I think an, uh, a Thunderbolt for I think two Thunderbolt 4s. This thing is certainly very interesting because it comes with a 2.8K OLED display at 90 Hertz and has an RTX 4050. Now the 4050 is only a 45 watt 4050. So it's not gonna be a super high powered 4050, but you're still gonna be able to play a lot of games on the Aero 14. I don't think it's as premium as the Blade 14, certainly in terms of build quality, but it's certainly an option if you're after an OLED display on a more budget friendly price at 1449. I like the Alienware X14 overall. It's it's very thin. Like it's it's really just a focus on thinness with the X14. But like for example, the display only being 300 nits bright, that's just behind the competition. I think the X14 has a lot of promise, a lot of potential, but you are gonna pay a real premium price for the Alienware brand. And we got some decent ports back here. We got, looks like a uh, one USB-A, or is that the power? I'm not, I think it's the USB-A. And then we got three USB-Cs, a headset port, 
on the back, that's interesting, and a micro SD card slot. It doesn't look like there's any ports on the sides. My experience with Alienware's software has been the primary downside for the Alienware series so far this year. I've reviewed two Alienware laptops, and both times the Alienware Command Center was pretty buggy and pretty annoying to deal with. Next up is the MSI Stealth 14. Now, I have done a detailed unboxing review of the Stealth 14, and I really liked it. It had excellent thermals. The GPU TDP is not quite as high. It doesn't quite go to the 105 watt range max but it gets you like 90% of the way there. And with the small overclock, you're gonna get close to the same levels of performance. I really love the look and feel of the laptop. It feels very light. It's kind of magnesium alloy chassis. It's not as premium or as rigid as the unibody chassis on the Blade 14, but it is very lightweight, like for its stiffness, I guess is, is what I would say for the, uh, for the Stealth 14. The specs on this are also kind of a little bit underwhelming. For $16.99, you get a full HD plus 165 hertz display. It is a vapor chamber cooled system, which I do like. RTX 4060, i7-13620H on here. I liked the speakers on the Blade 4, uh, on the Stealth 14. I liked the feel of the keyboard. Overall, especially if you just turned off the RGB, it does not look super gamery. It can be used pretty much in a professional environment, especially if you get like the blue version, looks very professional. The white one kind of has a little bit more of a gamery flair to it, I think. But I, I do like the Stealth 14, but it is also at a premium cost and it cannot be equipped with a 4080 or 4090 as well. So you, you gotta, there's like, it's pros and cons. Asus Flow Z13, this is another gaming laptop slash tablet that is less than 14 inches. So this is a 13 inch tablet display with a kickstand out, swings out backwards for a kickstand. You could you could travel with this, you could play with a, a controller, you know, being an RTX 4060, it's gonna be able to play games really, really well. It's a full HD plus 500 nits display with only 100% sRGB, but it's still, that's gonna be very, very good, obviously, right? And bright enough, you got an RGB see-through thing here in the back, which I do like. I did get hands-on with this as well at CES. I do like it a lot, the concept of it a lot. When you attach the keyboard, it, it, it snaps magnetically to the bottom here of the tablet. It basically lets you feel like you're using a laptop, mostly like you have a laptop. The main thing is it's gonna be a lot harder to put this in your lap if you're like actually sitting. You're gonna still need a table, basically. You wanna you want use this in laptop mode, you gotta have a table to set this thing down on, you know? So now the keyboard is backlit, the, the trackpad was was glass, if I remember correctly, on the little trackpad here. Here you got one USB-A here on the right. I believe that's a fingerprint sensor power adapter thing there on the left, a headphone port there. You can get this with a 4050 or 4060 up to 65 watts of power. So ports are one USB-A, one USB-C, one Thunderbolt 4, and you have the XG mobile port with a USB-C and a micro SD card reader. So that's actually a really good selection of ports. And I love that they managed to fit one USB-A on here as well. So, and you get a 13 megapixel rear camera and a five megapixel IR camera for front camera. That's Next up, we have the Flow X13. It's in the same vein as the Z13. This basically has, it's a tablet. The X13 is very similar, but it's in a full laptop form factor. And because it's in a laptop form factor, they actually put uh, some higher power limits to the GPU, it can go, um, I believe it can do 60 watts. Okay, so it's about the same power limit, but it can go up to a 4070 though, which is gonna give you a bit more juice for the laptop size. This Flow X13 costs $24.99. So this is almost, it's just a little bit less cost-wise compared to the Blade 14. So this is one of the laptops out there that is at least in the same vein of price as the Blade 14. Now this is also, I think, almost, an, it's more portable than the Blade 14 too, because it's only 2.8 pounds. Uh, I don't think it's quite as rigid or as high quality build quality as the Blade 14, but this also has some you know, unique usability because you can flip the hinge on the, Z, uh, the X13 and use it in tent mode or in tablet mode. You can use this for gaming on the go, upside down, or in tablet form factor, which could be a real advantage for people that are looking for a little bit more of a laptop-like experience, but in a super portable form factor. And this also has an XG Mobile port, so you can use the portable XG Mobile, which basically is like an eGPU that you can use to power the laptop and at the same time boost its performance with a much more powerful eGPU. The ZenBook Pro 14, this has an i9-13900H, 4070, 
32 gigs of DDR5 RAM, which I do love that it's 32 gigs, one terabyte SSD, and it's a 2.8K OLED display with 120 hertz, 550 nits brightness. It's really like a more of a premium competitor to the Blade 14. And I think it does compete pretty dang well with the Blade 14 in a lot of ways. The ZenBook Pro 14 Duo has dual displays. A Notice the side trackpad over here. This is something that on all the Duo laptops, it's been a bit difficult to get used to, honestly. The Duo laptops with the side trackpad, it's it's something that is definitely unique. Now, the nice thing about the Duo is that because the screen actually lifts up, it does allow for some additional air intake uh, and airflow on the chassis, usually allowing slightly higher power limits on a laptop of that size. Now. The dual display nature of this, this does come with the same OLED 120 hertz, 550 nits display for the main display, but it also has a secondary display down here that I think some people are gonna find really useful if you're a, I don't know, streamer or you're an artist or you want some, I, usually that secondary display is also touch enabled. And so this would be an interesting option for people that want that extra productivity. Me personally, I find it really difficult to use the keyboard on this type of a laptop simply because there's no wrist rest. And I, when I do a lot of typing, I prefer to put the laptop in my lap and I, I need that wrist rest. Otherwise my wrists just hurt. And, and I, like, I do a lot of typing sometimes. I need something that's super comfortable, usually with a decent sized wrist rest and a full size keyboard. So, but if the idea of dual displays is really attractive to you, then I think this one certainly could be another really good competitor to the Blade 14. So this is the external box. And this was in, this is the secondary box. There was a bigger box that was over this one. Here's our power adapter. This is a 230 watt power adapter. You can see right there, fairly small for how much juice it puts out. Notice that this also comes with like a premium rubber. Also notice the cable is braided, but it's something that other laptop manufacturers are not doing. And that's part of the razor tax. Some of the stuff that you're paying for that's extra, right? That you don't even realize you're paying for it when you buy the laptop. This thing is over six feet long. Power adapter right here is also reversible. So you can plug the laptop in like this or flip it around the other way. The power cable is fairly short. This guy is only probably four feet long. Here is the third box. All right, so when you unbox this guy, this is what you got. Right here, you have a Go Green with Razor, our commitment to sustainability. Part of the Razor tax, I guess, you know, all of this packaging is uh, recyclable. Biodegradable airbags, soy ink. Here's the laptop. It is wrapped in this kind of like, uh, but it's kind of like a plasticky material. And then we also have all of these documents right here here. All right, thank you for choosing a Razer system. Go to support.razer.com and you can also call this number. Notice that this number is a technical support number just for fixing your laptop, not to handle returns or anything like that. Congratulations, there is no turning back. Everyone knows that it's not just brute force that wins battles, it also requires strategy and agility, blah, 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 blah. But uh, you can read that if you'd like. Blade 14, it's like we got our little uh, quick menu guide here. We got a array microphone, webcam indicator light, built-in camera cover. Some of those are the, you know, again, extra features for the uh, the Razer Tax, right? Speakers by THX Audio. All right, USB 4 ports, uh, which are in the replacement of the Thunderbolt 4 because they are not Thunderbolt 4 compatible, but USB 4 ports have similar specs to Thunderbolt 4 in terms of its throughput. Uh, it just doesn't have the Thunderbolt 4 certification on them. With the appropriate power cord, then you can plug in and turn on the laptop. So you're just, just plugging it in first. Uh, and then the webcam, with the, the cover, if you see the red over the webcam cover on the laptop, that means the webcam is currently blocked physically. So you can't use Windows Hello or your webcam if you've got the cover, obviously. Nice stickers, if you're into stickers, you could put these on your forehead if you want and be a Razer fanatic. All right, and then we've got our uh, microfiber cloth. Definitely got some fingerprint smudges right here. Super noticeable. So here is the cloth that uh, goes over the keyboard. Ta this trackpad is awesome. Large, it has a nice click to it. You can easily do four or five finger gestures on it. And because it's glass, it feels just, it feels really premium. No flex, no flex, no flex, no flex, no flex. A little bit of flex up here, just, just a tiny bit. No flex, no flex. Going over the keyboard, 
Uh, just a little bit of flex over here in the middle. No flex in the keyboard, very minimal flex. Like one of the most rigid laptops that I've seen to date. This is an all metal top as well, is not very bendy. This has a little rubber rim edge thing going all the way around the display, okay? So this helps make it a nice clean chunk down onto the aluminum when it comes down and it makes it, you know, have a nice little magnetic like down onto it. So, you know, it's like rubberized connection touching all the way around, supporting the display as it connects to the laptop. It makes the laptop feel premium even when you're opening and closing it. Notice the air intakes are very easy. You can see right through them, which is gonna help airflow on a chassis like this. There's primarily two air intakes though there might be air intakes on the keyboard as well like going through the keys another two little grill vents here for air as well let's review the ports real quick the wi-fi 6e with bluetooth 5.3 is probably what we have in here we have two usb c's two usb 4 type c's with power delivery and display port 1.4 hdmi 2.1 and two usb 3.2 gen 2 type a ports then we have a 3.5 millimeter headphone microphone adapter port so so right here we have a usb 4 which has similar specs at least on paper to Thunderbolt 4, but it doesn't have Thunderbolt 4 certification. USB-A 3.2, Gen 2, HDMI 2.1, and a Kensington lock port. No ports on the back of the device. On the left side, we have our power adapter port that is reversible, a USB-A 3.2, Gen 2, and then a USB 4, USB-C, and our headset port. Now notice there's only four total USBs on here. There is no mini display port. There's no SD card slot of any kind. You do have display port 1.4 support on the USB 4s. So you can do high resolution, high display output through those or use USB 4 docking stations that can help you do, you know, have keyboard and mouse and hook it up to a display and all of that all in one port. And of course these also have power delay Delivery. So you can power the laptop through the USB-C force, but it's not gonna be as good as using the official power adapter port. You're gonna get full power of the 230 watts going through here and this is gonna be less. I'm not sure the exact specifications rated for powering with USB-C on here, but it's probably at least 60 watts, probably 100 watts or more. You're gonna need a specialized screwdriver head. Yeah, it's a T5, so there's eight total screws. They appear to be all the exact same size. Easy to get this to come up. Just kind of gently wiggling it though. It feels like something is still latched here in the back. There's the internals on the Blade 14. Ooh, look at that. Upgradable sodium slots. Notice as well that we have a full size 2280 SSD here. That's really great to see. That gives us a lot of upgradability options. I love the fact that it's also not soldered for any of the memory. So you're able to take this all the way up to uh, 64 gigs of RAM if you want to. 68 watt hour battery. Notice our speakers are reverse facing. It looks like there's multiple components to the speakers as well, not just a single component. They have a little sticker here. There it is. Yeah, so this just goes straight back for the power right here. Uh, you don't need to flip anything up or, or loosen anything. You just use a plastic pry tool like this and just pull it back. And now we can, if we wanted to, we can go ahead and take the RAM out. SK Hynix DDR5 5600 RAM. So they're actually running faster RAM, but they're uh, 4800 hundred actually on the motherboard. Okay, so notice that this is a single-sided SSD included in here. Looking at the depth here, there's quite large gaps here. These things, these pads here are quite large. Uh, if you took those little pads away, you might be able to fit a double-sided SSD in here, probably no problem. There's almost no space in the entire underside that is not being utilized to the max. Vapor chamber cooling here, the hot thermals are gonna warm up right here in the middle. They're going to travel the vapor is going to travel out here to the fan outtakes right here and right here they don't appear to do much because all of the heat fins are on right here to right here these are the heat fins but this middle section doesn't really have anything. A vapor chamber can basically use the full amount of cooling for either the GPU or the CPU completely. Cause all of the, if it's just the CPU or if it's just the CPU or just the GPU running, then it can, you know, it'll go right to the exhaust either way. And in addition, the nice thing about vapor chamber is it can also cover the VRMs and keep everything cool on the motherboard. Like it, you just get a lot more coverage 
There it goes. So it's getting faster. There you go. So Windows Hello working really fast and really well. Just know that if Windows Hello is not working, you may have the little cover here. There's a little webcam cover here at the top. You can actually see pretty good hair detail uh, on this webcam. Like appears to be pretty dang detailed all around. So it pretty, it's pretty wide angle as well. That is really good quality. Actually, that's that's far above average for a webcam. Um, I'd say it's a little dark uh, on the exposure. These arrow keys, I don't love the fat left and right arrow keys. I wish these were half size arrow keys. So it's a little bit easier to tell where your fingers are. I have gotten a little bit more used to them. Uh, having my Blade 18 for six months now. The keyboard backlight is very bright. That is off. That is one level of brightness, three levels of brightness up. I would say that this level of brightness is about the level of brightness of most gaming laptops. And then we have a whole bunch more levels of brightness to go up in terms of brightness levels. But know that the secondary functions up here, like mute, volume up, down. This is the display button to change your display settings. You've got uh, fast forward and rewind. Got fast forward forward, pause, play, and rewind. And then you also have uh, brightness down, brightness up. And then over here we have keyboard brightness down and up, print screen and delete slash insert. And then our power button here. And if you just tap the power button, nothing happened. Okay, you actually have to hold the power button down for like a half second at least in order for it to register. So just accidentally touching it is not gonna be a problem. Notice that the backspace key here is a little bit smaller than your typical backspace key on a Razer keyboard. We have a caps lock, light up cap. These are a little bit smaller than your normal keyboard size. I would say that the keyboard in general, yeah, it's just slightly smaller than like my Blade 18 keyboard, for example. So there's the Blade 18 keyboard. The arrow keys, about the same size, but like the these keys are all just a little bit bigger. Like the shift key is longer, the entry key is longer. All of these are a little longer. All of these keys over here are a little bit longer. And the top row is also a little bit taller. You know, these this top row, they're a little bit smaller sized. And these ones are a little bit narrower, a little bit narrower on the right side here as well. And of course that's just because of the 14 inch size. That's the Blade 18 trackpad size. It's like the biggest trackpad on a laptop these days. And that's the Blade 14 trackpad size. It's not that much smaller. Look at how massive this trackpad is on the Blade 14. This hinge feels really stiff, by the way. Like I move it and it's just, it feels really stable and sturdy, even with this Spider 5 Elite on there. So the important thing to keep in mind about this Spider 5 Elite is it does underestimate the color gamut by like seven, eight percent. That's probably the key thing when looking at the color gamuts here. Oh, sorry, 100% of sRGB, 88% of Adobe RGB, 93% of the P3 color gamut. So that essentially means around 95% Adobe, close to 100% of the P3 color gamut, which is really, really phenomenal colors. It's basically a, a professional level screen that you can do professional graphic design uh, and video editing work with 497 nits brightness, that's phenomenal. 980 to one contrast ratio, that is very good. I guess it's just, it's good. That's a good contrast, not amazing. So the G14 tested almost the same for the Adobe and P3 and brightness was only 427. So yeah, this thing is about 73-ish nits brighter. The Blade, uh, like the Blade 14 is brighter and the Blade 14 also has better contrast ratio than the Zephyrus G14 in terms of display quality. So mini LED is supposed to be a hundred nits brighter. So that would make it probably more competitive with this because that was the non mini LED G14 version. This is gorgeous. Like the display is not glossy. It gives the impression of what a lot of glossier, like lower nits brightness displays look like. The colors on this are popping really well. The level of contrast ratio is really good. This is a great laptop display, much better than the Blade 15. Is this as good as an OLED display? Not in terms of total brightness, not in terms of contrast, but it's not that big of a difference. I don't think between an OLED display and this one. And the nice thing about this display is that since it's not OLED, you don't have to deal with burn-in issues. So. Like people don't talk about burn-in issues, but I have seen laptops that have OLED displays that had burn-in 
if you keep the same desktop background all the time or you keep the start menu button up there all the time, eventually you're gonna have burn in with OLED. I don't think this is the brightest screen out there. I don't think this is the best contrast display out there, but this is excellent. And in the 14 inch category, this is the highest quality display that I have tested so far. So Razer Synapse is the Razer control software. Inside of here, you can adjust whether you want gaming mode to be enabled or just enable it when you launch a game. Switch the function keys which are the F1 through 12. You can make this top row either primarily F1, 2, 3, 4, or you can make them multimedia. You can see that under performance tab, there's different tabs up here. We have customized performance, display, battery, and lighting. Under performance tab, we have three primary power profiles. You got balanced, silence, and custom. Now under balanced, there's some customization. You have auto fans or you have manual fans. And so you could, you could make the fans real quiet and balanced mode will keep the laptop at a a pretty high power level, but it's gonna get hot. If you go down low fans with balance mode, it's gonna get warmer. If you go to if you go to balance mode high fans, you're gonna run max fans here. That's gonna keep the laptop pretty cool. In general, I would recommend keeping the fans on auto unless you're going to be gaming. And then you, once you get done gaming, turn them back off of max fans. When you're, when you're in the game, you can switch it to manual max fans if you want to have the coolest possible temperatures. Silent mode, there are no customizations. It's just going to try to power limit the CPU and GPU down quite a bit and reduce the fan noise as much as possible. Under custom mode, there are four different CPU custom customizations, low, medium, and high, and boost. For for GPU, there's low, medium, and high. There's also a max fan speed mode. This is this max fan speed mode is only available when you've set CPU to boost and GPU to high. You can basically get maximum possible performance in this mode. This is the best performance mode. If you don't have max fan button check, then it's on auto. If you want like a nice balance of acoustics, my recommendation is probably just doing balanced and auto. For our base acoustics, let's say it's 43. Let's go ahead and jump into custom mode. So this is starting to ramp the fans just a little bit in the background just to keep air flowing through the system at all times so that the laptop is ready to go for maximum possible performance. 49.6 decibels for the GPU boost mode. That's pretty dang impressive in my book. In this GPU boost mode, keep in mind we're in custom GPU boost. We don't have max fan checked though. Now we're doing 105 watts, 106 watts, 108 watts to the GPU. Our GPU core clock is only 2250, and this is an RTX 4070, but notice that we're occasionally dropping down our wattage and clock speed. Now our GPU temp is 69 degrees Celsius. That's really good. Our CPU temp, 63 degrees. That's phenomenal. Only 17 watts of power going through this Ryzen chip right now, not much, is needed to keep us pumping on Time Spy with some good frame rate. I will say the one thing is, like this GPU does keep dropping down the, the voltages to get a little bit lower boost clock at certain times. It's like it's not maintaining this higher level of boost clock. So if I was to tune this, I would probably tune it, uh, try to lock it to a voltage a little bit below where, it, you know, like a little bit below, like in the 90 watt range. And then I would try to overclock it to say 2300 lockstep. Let's turn on max fan mode here. All right, 55.6 decibels. That's very, that's lower than average for a max fan laptop. When most gaming laptops go to max fans, usually it's over 56, 57, 58 decibels, somewhere in that range. 70 degrees, 71 degrees. This is maximum fans right now. 68 degrees, 71 degrees on that CPU. Excellent temps for such a thin laptop. So under performance, we'll disable max fans. Ooh, 109 watts to that GPU. Saw that 75, 77 degrees. We're still spicying up our temps on the GPU. 68 degrees on the CPU. So getting a bit spicier, 74 now on the CPU. We're still not even anywhere close to thermal throttling on the CPU or GPU. We are in GPU boost, CPU boost, or like the maximum CPU GPU modes right now with auto fans. And we're doing 51 and a half decibels approximately, 75 degrees on the GPU, 74 on the CPU, still excellent. Now, if we were to go in here and do low, 
low. If we were doing over 100, now we're doing basically capping at 90 and our CPU is doing like 15. So still enough performance to actually play almost all games, no problem. Let's try out balanced mode on auto. 100 watts, 74 degrees Celsius, 66 degrees on the CPU. So 76 on the GPU, 66 on the CPU. Let's see how loud it is. For a laptop that is super, super portable, this is a very quiet gaming system. The one thing I will say about the fan noise is it is a little whistly. And let's do manual fan with low. So this is prioritizing acoustics while still having good performance. The fans are like completely quiet now. The CPU though, still hitting a good temp, 78. These right now are the G14's temps almost. Very similar to the G14 temps. Yeah, the laptop is basically entirely silent right now. Interesting, so now we're only doing 64 watts up here, 19 watts down here. We are thermal throttling, and so the power is having to come down on the GPU. So our performance has been significantly reduced right now. Let's see what we get when we go to silent mode, all right? 44. Okay, so this is like the fans running just a little bit. It was actually quieter when we did auto mode with no fans. 74 degrees right now. 67 on the CPU. Wow, these are actually pretty good temps. 88 watts going through the GPU, 115, 16 watts going through the CPU. We're getting about 85, 90% of the performance right now of the laptop at only 44 decibels of sound. So there's your fan noise testing, detailed fan noise testing on every mode. Now we're going to go to our max fan mode, high, boost. Okay, so uh, out the gate, 4.6, 4.5 to 4.6 gigahertz across all cores, doing 60 watts, 61 watts of power, 76 degrees on the CPU. Wow. It's amazing that we can do 4.5, 4.6 gigahertz across all cores at such a low wattage and temperature. 15,987 for our first run. CPU package power peaked at 80 degrees Celsius. The most package power we got was 65 to 65 watts 16,122 for our second run we actually went up a little bit in terms of performance which is very interesting 10 minute test activate 4.7 4.9 on some of the cores 4.69 on some of the other cores, 83 degrees, 80 degrees average, 70 watts of power pull, 90 degrees now on that CPU, 75 watts of power. We just saw 79, now 75. 5.9, it's like it's like the VRMs are like warming up and they're all juiced up now and they're ready to go or something. And our temps are also slowly climbing 93 degrees. I think we're gonna see thermal throttling here eventually if it's gonna keep these uh, wattage poles as high as this. And there is our first thermal throttle at 96 degrees and bounce back downward 77.7 watts now. It's slowly creeping up with the wattage. What is this? This is 84.2 watts is now our peak power pull. 79.5 watts being consistent power pull. 17,078. That is almost exactly what the Zephyrus G14 got in my 10 minute test. Just barely beating the Zephyrus G14. 17,019 for the Zephyrus G14. Uh, this is nowhere close to the thick, big, and beefy laptops that have a lot more cores and threads like the i9-13980HX and the Blade 16 and Blade 18. Those ones are gonna do more like 29, 30,000 in these tests. So pretty significant performance gains if you go with a thicker, bigger laptop. So we are in battery mode. Battery is on, battery right now is currently on 780M. RTX 4070 is disabled right now. So it looks like it's doing 35 watts of power through the CPU. We're doing 3.8, 3.9 gigahertz approximately on the P, on all of the cores. Our temps are just phenomenal at 57 degrees. So yeah, it seems to be just power limited to 35 watts on battery life. So we got 13,536. We are gonna be in custom, boost, high, max fans. This is the highest level of performance that the laptop theoretically can put out. Interesting, only 95 watts, 2265. We ended up getting 11,905. That's great. We were at 2265. 
65, 925 millivolts. Let's try going down, just down to 900, let's say. Let's do 890. Uh, let's go 200. Yeah, let's try that. This not only dropped our voltage that was going through the GPU, but it also raised the boost clock significantly. And this is not a super aggressive overclock, but this is a pretty strong overclock and undervolt at the same time. Notice also that we were pulling 108, 109 watts quite often. We are doing right around 99 watts, doing a higher boost clock at the same time. So this is an undervolt and an overclock at the same time. And we broke 12,000, 12,151. Excellent, love it. Okay, so we're ready to go into Apex Legends. We're on high settings. This feels really good to aim with. All right, this, this, this screen is excellent. It doesn't have too much ghosting. It feels very responsive. Like it's, I, I don't think it's quite like perfect, but I think it'll get even better when we switch it to a low settings here and get a lot higher FPS. Cause right now we're only doing 133 FPS, obviously very playable on high settings. Okay, so we are on low settings now. I can feel the increase to smoothness. It's quite noticeable. Um, okay, so 198, 130. Obviously, if you really wanna push higher frame rates, you could drop the resolution down to 1920 by 1200. Okay, and now we're doing over 240 FPS. And so it all depends on what you want. If you wanna prioritize frame rate or detail on resolution. Well, we annihilated that guy. Come to the me, me. That was a great gaming experience. You know, 188 for our average during the match, or at least for large part of the match is in the 180s, uh, is great. If you went with a more powerful like G14 with a 4080 or 4090, you might get more FPS in Apex Legends. Wow, we're doing such better FPS than the tough F15. Wow, 109 FPS right now is really good. Only 47 watts of power to the GPU, 62 degrees on the CPU, 31 watts of power to the CPU. So wow, the Blade 14 running this game much better than the tough F15 with a 4070. I don't know if it's the Ryzen CPU. I don't know if it's drivers have been updated. I don't know if the game got updated to be better, but wow, it was running over hundred FPS. It was like 105, it seems like on average with good 1% lows. It was really, really smooth, phenomenal gameplay. Let's see what we get in CSGO. I'm anticipating it'll be really good. We're uh, high settings QHD right now, below that, Wow, all the way down to 41 FPS there, yikes. Uh, it's pretty low, it's cause it's QHD resolution, right? 236.8 FPS. All right, um, our FPS right now doing 200, our 1% lows are really good. Not quite our 240 FPS refresh rate for the gaming laptop. Obviously we could just drop some settings down and get to the 240 Hertz refresh rate if we wanted to go 2560 by 1600 full screen. Ray tracing ultra, DLSS to quality. Frame generation is enabled, DLSS is set to quality. For reference, these same settings with my Blade 18 was getting around 140 FPS for anyone that's curious what a 4090 with an i9 CPU can do. So almost double the FPS with the Blade 18. This is still very good. So looking at our stats, we're at 58 for a 1% low, that's phenomenal. 71 for our average so far. Our video memory is almost max, basically max at 7.3 gigs. 11 gigs of our RAM is utilized, so we're not maxing our RAM in this game right now. 73 FPS on average. You know, because of the resolution, it's not really giving us a high FPS refresh rate gaming experience. 73.5 FPS, 56 for a 1% low. That's really good 1% lows considering 
running only 73 FPS. So this is obviously fast enough, good enough uh, refresh rate, resolution, all that stuff to give a good gaming experience. But uh, like I said, if I were to just change this, let's just drop it to high settings. Now look at our FPS, 116. And it, it definitely feels smoother. The gameplay feels smoother. I feel like I can aim a little bit better, a little sharper, um, going from you know 70 to over 100 FPS. Our temps are really good still, 67 degrees on the GPU, 71 on the CPU. So we're at DLSS on quality. Our graphic settings are on ultra. God of War, let's go. 97 watts of power, 2265 on the core clock for the GPU, 69 degrees on the GPU, 76 on the CPU. Very good overall performance here, still very playable. And obviously you can see a lot more detail uh, if you're playing at QHD and it would be a better experience in general, I think at QHD. You could drop this down to like say original graphic settings. It's still gonna look really good. And now look at our FPS, 104. Uh, the game still looks really good on original original settings. Time to hop into Hogwarts. Everything's set to ultra, ray tracing is enabled and textures are set to low. I did verify these settings yesterday. So, wow, our 1% lows are actually not doing terrible at 26. I'm not seeing too many horrible frame time stutters. And our overall FPS is really not that great. 60 is obviously playable. You could still play this game at 60, but I would probably try to be pushing closer to 90, especially if we have frame generation enabled. Our 1% lows staying at 35, that's very good. All right, so these are playable frames, 61, 31. Our VRAM is not being pushed to the max limit. Maybe we could go to medium. I would probably change the textures to medium and maybe set DLSS down to balanced. Oh, and, and I would probably just turn off ray tracing. That'd be the other setting I would I would nuke ray tracing as my number one priority because that'll probably give us instantly 30, 40 more FPS in all scenarios. And that would push us over closer to the 100 FPS mark, nuking ray tracing. So if you really want to keep ray tracing, then you can lower other settings or lower DLSS down to like uh, even performance mode. And I mean, right now it's still good. We're getting good at good playable FPS. Our 1% lows are above 30. Cool. Let's do our speaker test. There is THX. There is spatial audio you can enable and disable. And we can try playing some music here and turning some of these settings on and off. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so let's turn off spatial audio. Most of the settings didn't make much of a difference. I'm gonna be honest, I was clicking around on them. I didn't, we'll not, we'll not do volume leveling though, because that can make music kind of sound trappy. We'll do music and we'll have spatial audio enabled. So the total overall volume is not nearly as loud as my Blade 18. And I felt like when the mids are going by itself and the highs are going by itself, they sound really clear and pretty good. But when the bass came in, it kind of wiped out some of the mid sounds a bit and made them a bit muddled. So, and it also kind of muddled the bass a little too. Overall, like decent-ish for the laptop's size. Very clear mids and highs with some pretty satisfying bass. But in this one, the bass kind of comes in at different times than the mids and highs, so they don't kind of muddle each other as much. Overall, sound sound pretty good though. I love you like la 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 I love I love I love you like la 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 so the bass has a nice thump to it, but it's not as punchy as the Blade 18 or some of like, the Blade 18 is the number one speaker system, I think for gaming laptops so far in 2023. Still not as good as a MacBook Pro, but Blade 14 here being a noticeable step down from the Blade 16, which is a noticeable step down from the Blade 18. The mids and highs, very crisp and clear for the Blade 14. The uh, lows, not as strong or as punchy as I would love. And I would also say overall, all volume, like the total volume on the whole system is just quite a bit lower than the Blade 16 and 18. I would rate it 8.3. Blade 18 being like a nine, was a 9.1 or something like that. Uh, and a perfect 10 being a MacBook Pro. 2560 by 1600 for our resolution. Our settings are DLSS to quality, graphics quality to ultra. 66 degrees on the GPU, 71 on the CPU. That's still rocking pretty good. Uh, all right, so here we go for our benchmark. Let's go ahead and walk it. 71 FPS, 32 for our 1% low. The gameplay feels 
pretty dang good. Um, okay, so 76, 29. The gameplay feels really good. Dropped in here and just went uh, DLSS to balance. Let's see what that looks like real quick. Not too much of an FPS boost. Getting closer to 100 now. Well, we had a big stutter there. You can see the stutter on the frame time graph. All right, so DLSS on quality, 2560 by 1600 for our resolution. For our graphics, we're gonna be in ultra settings, but Last of Us has too high of uh, texture requirements. So we're gonna go down to medium on our textures. We're still doing 81 FPS for average right now, 65 for our 1% lows, which gives us a very tight frame time graph. You can see the frame time graph here. A little blip right there, but uh, very minor. Overall, very smooth, like exceptionally smooth visual experience. So we're in gameplay now. We were watching cinematic before. Gameplay tends to have a little lower FPS. Or sorry, 73 for our average, 61 for our 1% lows. So we would probably be able to get really smooth gameplay on this game, even if it was only averaging 45 FPS because the 1% uh, lows are so close to the average in this game. High quality ray tracing, DLSS on quality, frame generation is enabled. Reflex is enabled. 80 FPS there, 90 F, uh, 90 watts of power, great temps on the CPU and GPU once again. We've had great temps in every single game we've tried. 79 for our median FPS here, very good. All right, so here we are at QHD with all max settings with ray tracing enabled hitting 91 FPS. 78 for our 1% low, nice and consistent. Really great temps. Like that's probably the biggest thing that's right now that's setting the Blade 14 apart. 89 FPS, phenomenal. Let's do Witcher 3. All right, so our graphics says we're doing ray tracing on ultra, DLSS on quality. Frame generation is and needs to be enabled. So another setting we gotta change. Things are looking good because our 1% lows are really good at 51. Yeah, this is like bare bones FPS in terms of like, it's hitting playable FPS. FPS, but I would say it's less than ideal. So I try to keep them less than four hours. Otherwise I would do like 20 games every time I do a live stream. Wow, we're getting a lot of stutters there for some reason. Everything is like loading in again or something. Okay, now we're loaded in. All right, now it's better. Weird, okay, so 6450 for our QHD test. If we were to, if I was playing this, I would just go to graphics settings, I would flip this one switch off and maybe do to balanced on DLSS. Over 100 FPS now, 110 FPS. Disabling ray tracing and then doing QHD on DLSS on balanced with frame gen. Boom. Uh, and once again, our temps, 69 on the GPU, 73 on the CPU. We didn't have a single game push our CPU over 80 degrees. I don't, I don't think. Let's do our summary, okay? It's time to summarize. So I gave the Blade 15 a mostly negative review, not worth the money unless it goes on big sale or something, because mainly because of the display quality was not up to snuff, in my opinion for the price point of a premium device. This guy, it's got the display quality, it's got the thermals, it's got the, a high quality webcam, high quality speakers, but not quite the volume or bass that you get if you get a bigger, beefier laptop. I, I really like this thing. Like it is so tiny, pocket size compared to my Blade 18. Number one factor for me I, in terms of why I really like this thing is the thermals on it. Unboxing the laptop, the laptop was packaged well. It was easy to unbox, it was easy to set up. The software on the laptop itself is easy to use and control the laptop, it was consistent. The quality control on this was excellent. I had no issues on any of the um, keys or dead pixels or anything like that. The display quality, also really, really good. Like this thing is so bright, it's basically blowing out my camera on the display cause like I had to turn the brightness of the laptop display down cause it was blowing out my camera. Upgradeability, you can upgrade the RAM in this, you can upgrade the SSD likely to a double-sided SSD, full size 2280 SSD. The internals on it were good. Good layout, very efficient use of space. They maximized what space was available on this laptop. I really appreciate the Razer's design and engineering team. They did a fantastic job with the internal Taking the bottom of the chassis off is easy, super easy compared to most because of the CNC milled aluminum chassis, which also had superb rigidity and basically no flex in the laptop, except for just a little bit here and there, but overall excellent, super firm and rigid. The keyboard is a little bit more cramped than the larger laptops and even a little bit more cramped than some of the, maybe some of the other 14 inch laptops, but mainly it's just the side keys, the very end keys on both sides are shorter 
than most laptop keyboards. Other than that, the keyboard layout is pretty good and I love the functionality of the keyboard. Uh, uh, the secondary rows up here, really like that functionality that they have. Like the multimedia keys at one touch is just really nice. The touchpad is the largest touchpad I think you can get in a 14 inch device. So if you're after a large touchpad that feels good, premium glass touchpad. Windows Hello worked excellently on this machine and the webcam, again, above average image quality coming from the webcam with good detail on the beard and the hairs, but it was a little bit darker than I would ideally like, at least in terms of exposure. The speakers on this, I gave an 8.3 out of 10, mainly because the volume was not as loud as I would ideally like. And the mids can kind of get muddled with the bass and the bass wasn't quite as strong as the bigger Razer laptops that I've tested. Cinebench R23, 17,000. A 48 for our Cinebench R23 score was excellent. For an eight core, super thin light laptop like this, this thing is as portable as a 14 inch laptop can pretty much be. Uh, and it's still pushed 85 watts, 84 watts of power to the CPU. And it continuously improved its performance during the 10 minute run, which was weird, though it got closer and closer to thermal throttling. Time Spy, we managed to get 11.9K, 11 11,900 with stock settings. With a quick and dirty overclock, we got 12.2K. With more overclocking, you could probably get 12.3, 12.4, maybe 12.5K. In every game that we tested, we saw excellent thermals and excellent playable performance. Uh, every game was playable and very smooth. The 1% lows were very good in every game that we tested mainly because I already knew what settings to tweak. If I didn't make those tweaks, you would run into VRAM limitations because there's only eight gigs of VRAM and that's just not enough VRAM for ultra settings on textures in 2023 games. In the games that you can actually play QHD games at high resolutions and settings and everything, you can play them at those ultra high settings. But in the games that you can't play them at those ultra high settings, you can just you know drop DLSS down typically to balanced or performance mode and then bam, you're playable. Or maybe worst case scenario, you have to drop the native resolution if DLSS or FSR is not supported. Ports on this were high quality USB 4, but not Thunderbolt 4. That's probably the biggest downside to the ports. And for a 14 inch device, the ports on this are a little bit above average. We, we, we compared again, we, we compared this laptop versus all the other 14 inch laptops. And this has comparable ports or better ports than almost every other laptop out there. In web browsing, live streaming, or like streaming some kind of thing like Netflix or YouTube, I would, I would expect right around the eight, nine hour range mark on medium brightness and keyboard backlight off. If you do something more stressful and heavy, like an unoptimized browser, like Google Chrome, for example, you're not gonna get as good a battery life, probably more like in the five, six, maybe even as bad as four. Big criticism of this laptop, it's that it just doesn't have a 4080 or a 4090 available as a configuration option. And that is going to be a problem for some people that just want to have the most poor, the most performance in a 14 inch form factor. And if you want that, you got to go with the Zephyrus G14. But if you're okay with the levels of performance we saw today, then yeah, a 4070 still puts out great frame rates at QHD gaming, as long as you turn textures down in certain titles. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this live stream. That's it. I'll see you guys in the next one. We didn't drop any frames this live stream. Herza! Oh, 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 oh,